There have been reports recently of uh, Thai dissidents who have fled Thailand in the last few years, uh, being abducted and even murdered um, in countries in Southeast Asia. Can you fill us into the general background of this new development? Uh, well, I have to start with providing you a, a short political context. The coup took place in Thailand in 2014, and after that there had been a attempt of the Thai state uh, to uh, eliminate you know, what, what they perceived to be sort of enemy of the state. And unfortunately, these people you know, had to run away because they had been brand, branded as enemy of the state. So either, either these people would cross over Thailand into neighboring country illegally or legally. But somehow, a lot of them uh, ended up in, in, as I said, neighboring country in Laos and in Cambodia in particular. Uh, since 2017, I would say, uh, about two or three years ago, again, there is another attempt of the Thai state uh, to, uh, to cross over, to abduct them and to kill them. The first case came in, uh, I think, to 2017, when a prominent uh, red shirt. You could also say that this, these people sort of have anti-monarchy you know, sentiment. Uh, one of them, uh, starting in 2017, uh, has been abducted and vanished. Until now, we don't know what happened to that person. Uh, his name is DJ Sun Ho, also quite famous for the underground you know, audience. A year later, another, another red shirt, uh, also in Laos, uh, was abducted and this time it was documented that he was killed brutally also because you know he has sort of led uh, underground movement not just only uh, being anti-junta but also being anti-monarchist figure uh, as of last christmas another three were abducted from their stronghold in lao one of them uh, was a prominent red shirt. His name is Surashai Sadan. You know, he was sort of ex-communist. In fact, used to be, you know, a member of uh, Thaksin-led uh, political party too. So three of them uh, disappeared from their house in Lao until uh, December 2018 when two bodies was uh, two bodies were discovered, you know, in Mekong River, and then later on, after the autop autopsy, you know, they can identify that these two definitely were assistant to uh, Surajai Sedan. Until now, we don't know what happened to Surajai. I would assume that he was killed, uh, but then you know the body has not been found. Uh, a few months later, also another three ran away from Lao to Vietnam. One of them was also another prominent red shirt. His name is Lung Sanam Luong, or Uncle Sanam Luong. Uh, the story had, has it that uh, the Thai authority uh, contacted the Vietnamese authority to have them uh, deported to Thailand. That's what we all know. But until now, uh, let's assume that there was a sort of deportation. We do not know what happened to these three people. Now, this happened uh, outside you know, the Thai border. What also happened inside Thailand, for example, a number of political activists have been attacked. Okay, one of them is a prominent young uh, political activist, Cha Niu, right, has been attacked at least twice. The last time was quite serious, you know, when he was hit in the head, has to be hospitalized. So what I'm, what I'm, tra what I'm saying here is that there seems to be an, an ongoing trend for the Thai state to go after those uh, whom they think uh, to be uh, critics of the junta and also the monarchy. Uh, well, I mean, that, that also goes to show that, you know, the life of the, the dissident, Thai dissident in neighboring country uh, is no longer safe. I would come back later also for my case, if you'll be yes, interested. Yes, that was, can you talk about the case of uh, one of the dissidents who had fled to Malaysia and then was recently deported back? What's yes. happened? Well, I mean, this is uh, an, an, an elder lady uh, activist you know i don't know her pers i don't know her personally but uh, from what i have read in newspaper uh, she has been she has been wanted you know for her again anti monarchy at, uh, uh, attitude so she fled to malaysia and i was told that she in fact was in the process of uh, of getting uh, refugee status with with the unhcr in in malaysia but uh, 
under the the, the Thai requests, the Malaysian government has decided to hand hand to hand her over to Thailand. So, uh, so again, we try to contact you know her family and also to try to find out what happened after she was deported back to Thailand. We know nothing about it. So this is also raised an 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 alarm of uh. This is not now no longer about you know the the Thai state going after its critics, but it also sort of collective attempt of country in Southeast Asia, you know that sort of come after uh, pro democracy, uh, human rights champion, you know. Uh, so you're saying this is a, become an ASEAN issue? Yeah, it's a question of whether ASEAN you know is prepared to stand by at least some element of respecting human rights yeah, or are I mean, they in a kind of a collaboration to 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 uh, you know sub help each each other suppress their own dissidents well the issue of human rights and democracy in southeast asia in asean has always been very contentious anyway so i mean as someone who used to work you know for the government uh, in the foreign service i know that maybe it, it it come to time that maybe we we might not be able to have trust in ASEAN, you know, in terms of providing protection, you know, for for dissident, you know, and let alone even talking about you know the issue of human rights. So I think uh, a lot of regimes in Southeast Asia, you know, you have to say that none of them really that democratic. Even you know, in a nutshell, they look democratic, but deep inside, you know that it it is really not. You know, I can't say that the Thai government now is democratic. So you see this trend of a number of regimes in Southeast Asia sort of working together in a kind of loose, informal alliance, you know, of, I would say, illiberal uh, regimes. And I think sadly Malaysia, I mean, I, I was disappointed, you know, knowing that Mahathir, you know, coming back and this would be a new era of democracy in Malaysia. But, you know, the fact that Malaysia decided to send back this uh, poor lady back seemed to show that uh, that ASEAN has a long way to go. What's happened to her in Thailand? We, we don't know. So after she was deported, you know, we tried to find out what happened to her. Uh, we have not been told. So I'm, I'm not sure at this point in time whether she has already been in custody, she has been bailed out or not. I doubt it though that she has been bailed out. So I think somehow she's still uh, under detention. So let's move to your own personal experience of being a, a dissident who has had to seek protection abroad. Um, so first of all, give us a, a bit of background of why the Thai government sees you as a dissident and an enemy of the state. I have been very critical of, of the institution in Thailand for so long. This is partly because I'm an academic, you know, and I teach, you know, Southeast Asian politics, including Thai politics, to talk about Thai politics and not to mention, you know, relevant institution, you know, I would have, you know, betray my professionalism. So that is one thing. Second thing is basically because I'm a Thai and, you know, I'm concerned about the human rights and democratic situation in my country. So because of that, because of me being for so long critical of the institution, the Thai state used this opportunity of the coup 2014 in order to undermine, you know, its critic. And here, you know, it came after the coup, they summoned me twice to have my attitude adjusted, you know, through this process called attitude adjustment. I don't know since when my attitude is so bad that it needs to be adjusted, right? So, of course, I rejected the, the summon because I'm convinced that I have done nothing wrong. As an academic, you know, I think this is the thing that I'm supposed to do. Because I rejected the summon, so they decided to issue a warrant for my arrest. And then shortly they revoked uh, my passport, forcing me to apply for refugee status with the Japanese government. But even after that, you know, from 2014, uh, the harassment has never stopped. You know, they harass my family. At least they send, you know, military men to my, to harass my mother, you know, at least three times. Okay, the last time was quite a while ago, but yet they, 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 continue, to, they continue to do so. And as for me, you know, uh, traveling overseas, I come across many difficulties, you know, the Thai, the Thai government, you know, try to seek help from other government in order to stop me from traveling. Last test would be uh, in July on the 8th, uh, around 4 uh, in the morning, you know, a man 
dressing in black, broke into my apartment in Kyoto, uh, and then uh, walked into my bedroom, and then uh, started to attack me with a chemical spray, uh, before he successfully ran off. You know, undoubtedly, this has this have to be, you know, from, uh, you know, I'm I'm sure that the order has come from the the, the Thai government. Uh, and this is it, again, once again, because I have never stopped, you know, criticizing, especially the Thai monarchy. You know, there are a lot, there are a lot, a lot to criticize. You know, uh, given the fact that uh, we just started the new reign not long ago, and then also given the fact that uh, there have been going on inside the wall of the palace, especially in terms of the king trying to consolidate, you know, his political power, and because of that, you know, I have written a lot, you know, my article in my lecture, and I don't, I don't think they're very happy with that. So, just to be clear, this recent assault that you suffered, do you see it as an attempted abduction or just an act of uh, intimidation? I think, uh, I think this is an act of intimidation because it seemed it seem as though the attacker wanted to, to send a message that, you know, we could do more, you know, but, but, but he had just to intimidate, intimidate you from the time being. So I think the main purpose for them, basically, for me to shut up, right? Now, you're very prolific on social media. Um, have, uh, have the people who have been following your posts or reposting them, have they faced any threats from the Thai government? Funny that you asked that question because a few years ago, the Thai government issued a statement I don't know whether it's going to call statement or the decree or whatever, but, but it's sort of a public warning that the Thai public must not follow, follow three of them. Me, one of these three. Okay, the other two basically, another one is also another f uh, fame academic in exile. The other one is uh, a, a Scott uh, journalist. Three of us happen to be, uh, you know, critics, fierce critics of the monarchy. So the Thai state issued that statement that they must they must not contact, make any contact with me through social media platform, either sharing my statement, you know, on their own uh, Facebook, clicking like, uh, uh, some something like that, you know, otherwise you could face some consequences. But at the end, it did not work because there was, there has, there was no law to sort of underpin uh, to underpin this, this statement. If anything though, uh, the ban came and then it, it gave me even more followers because you know, for those who do not know what's happening, they start to find out, oh my God, who are these three people? And then they start to follow me more. Yeah, I mean, it, to, ask, to answer your question, I don't think there would be any direct uh, consequence of any, anyone following me, but there has been a threat from the Thai state. I, I have heard that there have been cases of people being issued with summonses, if not arrested, for simply posting on on social media. Is that true? It's, it is true. I think the trend, you know, it, it has been going toward that direction. You know, firstly, they would target whoever criticized the monarchy. Definitely, this is one of the one of the, 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 the top agenda for them. You must not criticize the monarchy. But in the past, they would charge you with less majesty law. Less majesty is uh, defined as Article 112 of, of the Criminal Code that, you know, anyone who criticized the monarchy would be put in jail between 3 to 15 years. So this has been, this had been a trend until recently that they moved it to Computer Crime Act. So under the Computer Crime Act, you know, they would, they would of course, you know, arrest anyone who would make that kind of statement. But, but, but it just, it just too weak, it allowed them to stretch the law, you know, from now on, not only you criticize the monarchy, if you criticize the military, then you could also be arrested, right? So I think, I think this is a chain of, of, of a tactic, you know, I think partly because the monarchy has realized that using too much of less majesty would cause a huge damage, you know, on, on, the, on, the, on the king's image. So that's why they switched to computer crime. But I mean, but, but the, the end result is the same. You continue to put people who disagree with you in jail. Now, maybe you could make some comment about the, uh, what the character is of the state of government in Thailand since the last election, because a very peculiar uh, sort of uh, situation followed the election. This is a difficult question because I myself, I don't even know, you know, what I know is that we are in a state of flock, you know, in Thailand. Uh, 
the sad part of it is that you know as much as we know that the current government is not really that democratic but the way in which it came to power through electoral process it sort of give legitimacy to the government so it's very difficult for any political activists uh, or political movement to come out on the on the street and then to point the finger that no you're not democratic because once again they came through electoral legitimate process so that's why i think thailand gets stuck once again gets stuck with a government that has little concern about human rights about democracy right but at the same time you can't get rid of it i think more difficult than that is is the real power behind the current government in thailand we know that you know the monarchy you know even though it, it is supposed to be above politics, but you know, through the year, from the last king until the current king, the monarchy has continued to interfere into politics until today. So, and, but the, 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 the bad part of it is that we can't even talk about it. So when you can't talk about it, the concentration would only be the current government, that you put the blame on the government without touching something higher or more powerful. So the, I think this is the situ situation of Thailand right now. Now, recently, an Australian newspaper, the Sydney Morning Herald, reported that um, one of the ministers in the new government uh, had formerly been arrested on, on, a, on a drug, drug importation charges in Australia and jailed for several years. Um, what does this case uh, reveal about uh, you know, the state of, of, of affairs in Thailand? The failure of good governance in my country. The failure, uh, in a sense that uh, we have rule and regulation, especially uh, those who had, you know, tainted past. You know, you're not supposed to assume this uh, this very important position in the government, the position that you're supposed to be transparent and also accountable. So basically, uh, this guy, apparently a very influential guy, you know. Uh, we be, be, uh, becoming involved into uh, this drug trafficking in Australia, continue to hold the position with the active support from the co from the current government. Once again, it's going to show how much this government uh, perceive uh, the issue of rule of law, uh, good governance. So basically, we cannot have any hope, right? Uh, the government's going to, to defend him. Uh, that seemed to suggest that uh, this guy has to be rather powerful, uh, has to perhaps maybe hold some sort of secret <laughs> behind, you know, the, the current government. And I mean, there's a rumor that, you know, he also got support from the palace too. So, uh, so that's why when, when, when the Australian media, you know, uh, report, reported this, uh, this news, uh, he, it, it had caused a stir, you know, in Thailand. But just like all things, you know, in, in, the, in, in, in the Thai, uh, in a Thai political context right now, I think the government has become so confident that even if something, something this bad, something this critical happening in the government, but the government continue to survive. And I'm sure that, you know, this story will eventually die down. So, I mean, I don't know what to say, really. I mean... What, 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 what does this say about the, the role of the military in, in Thai society today? You know, this is the 21st century, and right through the previous century, I think Thailand has had numerous military coups. Governments may come and go, but the military remains. Now, there have been a lot of reports that suggest that the military or parts of the military uh, leadership mm are quite involved or integrated with criminal gangs, with, you know, illegal, um, um, well, drug trade and, and illegal foresting, uh, perhaps even the, 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 uh, the slave trade. And on top of that, you know, the, what's the connection between the military that, that, that you know, remains the real governments yep. and, and the Thai monarchy? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Uh, yes. We have had the most military coup in the entire of Southeast Asia. This is something when I tell my student, something that I'm, I'm never proud of. You know, we, uh, other country might hold other, other impressive record, but we hold this record of having the most military coup in Southeast Asia. If I'm not wrong, we are the third in the world having the most military coup in the entire planet. So that seems to show that uh, the, the extent to which the military had had tremendous role in Thai politics to the point that I, I, I have to admit 
it has become a part of the Thai political culture. So uh, once again, talking about Thai politics, not talking about the Thai military, you would have a misperception of the, of the, of the whole thing. So uh, this is how the military had made its ways into Thai politics. In fact, this is not even a recent phenomenon. It had been with us for so long. I would say since the ab abolition of absolute monarchy in 1932. Partly uh, the, 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 the reason that the military can strengthen its position in politics because of its association with the monarchy. So the two institutions, the monarchy and military, have sort of interdependent in, in in interdependent relationship, you know, the military uh, exploited uh, the monarchy uh, in order to 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 give itself a, a, a particular role in politics. You know, defending the monarchy, it's just like defending national security. So because of that, uh, because of that, once again, uh, it is sort of give itself this particular particular role. So let's say uh, the military has a lot of influence in shaping the Thai, the Thai politics. And in fact, together with, monarchy, to, together with the monarchy, they have come to, to define and redefine political landscape in Thailand. They would set up a kind of po political uh, system whereby elected government has to be kept weak or vulnerable. Should they prove to be too challenging or threatening, they would be, you know, eliminated through the usual trick, military coup. That's why we have had sort of 20, 21, 22 military coup, including the previous one in 2014. So, I don't know. I think we try to look up to what happened in Indonesia. You know, this is, this is a case of very successful demilitarization of politics. But I don't, I think Thailand is still a long way to go. I think it's had, the military had embedded itself so deeply into Thai politics that, 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 that you can't imagine not having the military. Not because I, I, I supported it, but it's very, it's very unimaginable to talk about Thai politics without the military. A lot of Thai people, especially the middle class, Bangkokian, they would see that the, the military could somehow provide solution to the Thai crisis. You know, when you have a lot of bad elected government, you know, corrupt government like that of Thaksin or Ying Lak, you know, they think that the military would come and solve it, you know, by pressing that reset button but time and time again you know we know that the military would make the situation worse